Currently driving. I have no idea where I'm going right now. Uh, I just decided to get up, get in my car, and go somewhere today. Somewhere I've never been. places in Louisiana I have not explored. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember me going to the Whitney Plantation. It's, you know, it's like an Edgard, Louisiana. Um, very popular tourist spot. Look at the water, guys. Louisiana. Because <laughs> I heard there were loads of plantations down here and I like to explore plantations. Closed. I'm so hurt. We came all this way and it's closed. Wow. This. Open Thursday. Oh my God, I came down here on the wrong day. Oh. Um, I am here at the Magnolia Plantation. It took forever to even find this place. Well, when I found it, the road was closed and the website did say something about coming south on 119, LA 119, and not the other way. I came the other way because that's my GPS brought me that way and the road closures, there were road closures. So just on the other side of the road closure signs was Magnolia Plantation. So luckily I ran into a park ranger. He told me how to get around it. So I had to drive all the way back around and come south of the road closure. I see a sign here. I see a sign that says Cane River Creole National Historical Park, Magnolia Plantation. The tour starts at 2.30. I probably should have chose a weekend to come to both the Melrose Plantation and the Magnolia Plantation. Melrose Plantation was my go-to thing today, but I'm bummed out, I'm sad. I'm very sad about it. I'm gonna have to find my way down here some other time and possibly bring somebody with me so I won't be bored because that ride was like very bored. Boring ride <laughs> and it's free. So all of these plantations are a part of the Cane River Creole National Historical Park. So there's quite a few. So the Melrose one is a part of it as well. Oakland Plantation, I wanted to go to that. I've heard some things about that one. Um, but that's in the morning, I missed that one. It was for like nine something. So the only thing really left like late in the evening as a part of the Cane River Creole um, Park is the Magnolia Plantation. So my feet are sweating. I don't have any socks on. That have tennis shoes on. It, it appears I'm the only person. So we'll see. Hello, I'm good. How are you? Uh, long after the, the Civil War, and it's that 
green and yellow John Deere sitting in the, the barn right there mm -hmm. uh, that ended the cotton plantation era, and that's the two-row cotton picker. That's from the, the 1960s. And so that's really what changes um, the rural world in this area. All of a sudden, there's no more work for people down here on the farms, and so they have to, to go into Alexandria, Shreveport, bigger cities, and try to find work if they can't find work. Okay, we're gonna start down here first. It's the blacksmith shop. The blacksmith was one of the most important of the skilled workers on the plantations. Uh, every plantation wanted their own blacksmith on site uh, because if anything broke or needed repair, hose needed sharpening, whatever, uh, the blacksmith would be able to take care of that right away if they had one on the property. So, uh, the building itself is made out of bousillage, which is basically adobe. It's a clay type construction, very durable, really good um, construction method for this uh, climate. In the summer, these are going to be cooler inside and they'll be warmer in the winter. The wear on the, um, the sill, that this is the, the original sill, there's people stepping on it over the years, wore it down. Now the blacksmith shop tended to be dark, especially around the forge area because the blacksmith needed to see the color of the iron as it heated to be able to tell the temperature of it. If you've ever heard the term red hot or white hot, mm -hmm. that comes from, from working metal. And mm -hmm. The uh, iron starts out kind of as a, a deep cherry red and it goes, as it keeps getting hotter, it goes all the way to white, which is welding temperature, that's the hottest. This uh, rectangular, it looks like they dismantled the early one and used the brick to rebuild the, the later one. The blacksmithing was extremely important craft in Africa as well. They had a very long history of iron smelting and iron working. The blacksmiths were actually a caste in most of the, the West African cultures. It was found that somebody had been enslaved and brought to the New World. If they had been a blacksmith in Africa, that was what they were going to do in the New World because mm -hmm. they were used to working with the iron. They just had to adapt to the, the European tools that they'd be given to work with. Colony uh, period, then all enslaved persons were either baptized as, as Catholics just like the owner which was a big step up because in a lot of places at that point, um, people of African descent weren't even considered to be fully human. Mm -hmm. nice. Nice. The, the door is typical for a blacksmith shop. Uh, they put the brands in to make sure they look right. Um, but this is also a good place to hide things. Mm -hmm. uh, there's things in here that are not brands. Uh, got the little square with an X here, got X's and six-pointed um, asterisk looking things. Um, we don't know for sure that it was done here, but we do know in some areas. If you've ever heard the story about the, the quilts being used to um, hide messages mm. from the Underground Railroad for people traveling, uh, blacksmith shop doors could do the same thing. They could, if they had a code, particular mark meant something to somebody in the community. The blacksmith could um, just mark it on the door. Overseer, owner walking by here would never take a second look at the mm. door. But somebody in the community knowing that you know they might need to pass a message or something could just walk by and glance over and, and go, oh yeah, there, there that is. You know, so these were, were used for, for hiding things in plain sight. Gotcha. Well, for the enslaved workers here. Uh, it's marked on a map from 1858. Um, so a surveyor drew out all the, uh, the majority of the buildings on the plantation, wrote what they were. We also have a letter from the overseer to Mr. LeCount telling him that um, the blacksmith from Shallow Lake, Daniel, uh, became ill and they brought him up here to the hospital where he later died. Mm -hmm. But uh, when the house is burned down, 
then the family moves over here and they turn this into their home okay. in 1864. And they lived here for about 30 years. And then once they rebuild the, the main house, then this becomes the home for the overseers. Okay. And right now we just use this for um, performance and display and lecture space. Um, but we got an interview with a man that grew up here. Uh, his dad was one of the last overseers. And he walked us through every room, told us what they had on the walls, what they had on the floor, what kind of furniture they had, everything. So we have a full uh, report. So if we want to do a historic furnishing uh, to that time period, then we can have it as accurate as possible. In this room, um, slope of the floor, uh, because this was the porch. And so this would have drained the water away from the house. When they turn rings into porches or porches into rings, they never bother to level the floors. Mm -hmm. We've got the punkah, the ceiling fan up here. A rope would be tied to that chain. And generally, um, during the slavery period, a child slave would sit at the side of the room and pull on the rope, and mm -hmm. that causes the, the fan to swing. Mm -hmm. uh, this is very typical of what you see in Louisiana. If you ever go to the big showpiece homes over in Natchez, Mississippi, mm -hmm. um, one of the houses has a huge carved wooden one, mm -hmm. but this is very typical of what you'll, you'll see in this area. Okay. This was kind of a T-shaped okay. building. Porch is always an important part of the house uh, because this is where you would have spent most of your time. Um, actually, I think I'm going to get the keys and we're going to take the cart the rest of the way. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when they're mowing, it mm -hmm. scares up all kinds of critters. Uh -huh. And so we'll, we'll, we'll take the cart. <laughs> okay. <laughs> technically seven and a half mm -hmm. of the quarters uh, cabins for the enslaved workers here. Uh, there were originally 24 and two rooms in each cabin. So there would have been two families in each cabin. Mm -hmm. uh, had separate uh, rooms, separate fireplaces, but they, they shared a chimney. Now these were built around 1845. So they served the, the enslaved community for about 20 years. Uh, the brick was made here on the plantation uh, by the Mason built cabins. And we don't have a list of the, um, his enslaved community here showing that he would have needed that many cabins. Mm -hmm. um, most we have here at any one time is about 130. But um, and that's, that's families for the most part, a few single men, but mostly, mostly family. Now this one's kind of interesting because this is the only one that has a window on the front. Mm -hmm. um, they were allowed to um, start reconfiguring the cabin as they needed to. Um, this is going to be happening in the, the early um, 1900s, basically. They start personalizing their space. Uh, at that point, one family has the whole cabin, uh, so it's not divided. Mm -hmm. um, and they have yards out here. Um, and so you start seeing um, 
a little bit of personalization of the cabin. They can add rooms to the back and sides if they need more space. Um, the reports were done in the uh, mid-1980s. Somebody was um, selling pastries and coffee and maybe an adult beverage out of their cabin. Mm -hmm. So we think that it was this cabin, because mm -hmm. you wouldn't necessarily want people coming in all the time, mm -hmm. but you could serve them out the window mm -hmm. here. And uh, the, ex uh, the archaeologist put an excavation unit right in front of the window and found a bunch of coins from the, the early and mid-1900s. Uh, these all had wooden porches on them, so mm -hmm. if somebody got their change and they dropped it, it might go down between the mm -hmm. cracks, and so that's why I collected. Yeah. So we're pretty sure that that was the, the one that was kind of the drive-through right. for the community. <laughs> now the, the little cabin behind this one is just a single room. Um, we got hit with a, a tornado in mm -hmm. 1939, and it damaged a lot of the cabins. That was bad enough that they only rebuilt half of it. Mm. Okay. Again, this is the time when only one family is living here. So they have their living area and kitchen here, and then the other room would be for the, the bedroom. Okay. Go on. Watch your head as you go through there. So. Why is it so small? Um, that was just the, the way they, they kept the doorways. Okay. <laughs> and uh, that gentleman um, and his family were the last ones living here at the mm. other cabin. And their son that was born after they left here, he went to work for the Park Service as a carpenter. So he helped restore oh. his families and friends. Uh, cabins here. Yeah. Okay. And of the quarters, this is uh, 1904, and so this is the the last generation of enslaved workers here, and the first generations of, of free people here. Of course, New Orleans always topped the list in number of deaths from the yellow fever epidemics, um, but um, there are stories that Cluchyville lost half of their population in uh, the epidemic that year, and there was only one year, that was 1873, when um, Shreveport actually had more deaths than uh, uh, New Orleans did. means to get the seeds out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, originally, cotton was never seen as profitable uh, because um, the variety that grows best over wide distances, um, it's real hard to get the seeds out. Now, the um, sea islands of South Carolina and Georgia, there's a, a type called sea island cotton, and the seeds are pretty easy to get out of, of that. But, it doesn't grow very widely until about 1792. Eli Whitney invents the cotton gin, and um, it is a way to get the seeds out quickly, and so cotton is going to become the main cash crop for the South at that point. And what they would do is bring a wagon full of freshly picked cotton from the field, drop a big tube down in it, turn on the fans, it draws the cotton up into the back of that machine. That top roller that has the spikes on it, mm -hmm. then starts stretching the cotton out and goes through a couple of cleaning processes. When it gets to this row on the bottom, 
where all the slots are. Each one of those slots has what's called a gin saw. What's left can be pressed for oil, and cottonseed oil is still used. It's what, if you look on um, baked goods like cookies or crackers, that's going to be one of the oil options mm -hmm. uh, still. And what's left from the pressing um, is then fed to cattle. Those two boxes on the back wall, the box on the left starts filling first, and there's a, a tramper that's packing the cotton in. A lot of times the cotton would get tangled up in the machinery and the men would have to reach in and pull it loose while the machine's running. Mm. So OSHA would have had a fit <laughs> set up. But um, they developed a system called calling the press. The foreman would have a series of songs that he kept in cadence with the machine mm. or they would do a call, call and response. He would give one line, the workers would give the second line mm -hmm. back and that helped save a lot of people but still a lot of people were maimed or killed because of the the power yeah this is typical um, this these were taken in the 1930s uh, by the wpa uh, somewhere here in Louisiana, probably not too far from here, um, but um, they're what's called chopping cotton, mm -hmm. which at this point the cotton is pretty well thinned out. Yeah. In here is the press. This did not gin the cotton, they would have had a separate gin. Uh, so this is probably 1830s equipment. Now the screw up at the top does not turn. Um, it just slides up and down in the track from that double beam down the sides across the bottom. This whole machine turns around the screw. Mm -hmm. So if you think about the, the nut turning and not the bolt, mm -hmm. uh, and so that's just going to move up and down. That uh, screw comes all the way down uh, through this chute right here. So. Uh, they'd be standing upstairs, uh, this deck above us would have been solid, and they drop the cotton uh, that's already had the seeds taken out down the chute. Uh, the bottom box is lined with burlap, has some straps ready to go, and as they, they drop the cotton in, of course the cotton is nice and soft and fluffy, but they needed it to get packed down pretty well. Mm -hmm. So many times a young uh, man or a boy would get inside the chute and stomp the cotton down mm -hmm. um, and get it packed in. And they would just keep doing that until they could not get any more cotton in there. A basic standard bale, this is about 460 pounds. People think of cotton as being nice and soft and fluffy. That's hard as a rock. Mm -hmm. The Confederates actually stacked these around the boilers of the, the ships during the war. Uh, they call them cotton clads, so this was the armor. If an artillery shell hit this, it would absorb the impact. Uh, if, even if it caught fire, they could just roll it off the, the side of the boat. Mm -hmm. uh, but this protected the boiler. Mm -hmm. And uh, in 1860, Ambrose LeCount sent 1133 bales of cotton about this size to New Orleans. Mm -hmm. In today's money, that would be a little over a million three. Wow. So you can see how, why they wanted to keep slavery as a system because of the labor that right. it produced, the, yeah. the kind of wealth was, people don't realize that, you know, in today's money, they're, they're millionaires mm. easily, so. Wow. It was, uh, Y'all, I'm almost home. I actually stopped in my original hometown, uh, Caldwell Parish, Columbia. Um, that's where I'm really, 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 really from. I know I claim Winsboro, Louisiana, but um, Columbia is where I'm really from. So, y'all, I had stopped earlier at a gas station, and I had two of the pieces gas station pieces are always 
the bomb. So it was good and it was hot. I enjoyed it. Um, I have 36 minutes to go. Um, like I said, I'm in Columbia. I stopped at Sonic because I wanted a cranberry juice. How you doing today? Hello. My name's Thank Davey. You. I'll be your car for today. Get a large cranberry limeade. Um, it wasn't limeade. It was just a cranberry. Cran you didn't have a cranberry limeade. You just wanted a large cranberry. Mm -hmm. Large, just a large cranberry drink. Yes. I'll be right back. Okay. I'll get fix that for you. Thank you. Shortly. Okay. Maybe I, the cranberry lime probably was good. Cranberry lime probably was good. I probably should have kept it. Sounds good. Mm -hmm.